as the Battle of Britain raged in the skies above the English Channel throughout the summer and fall of 1940, RAF pilot officer D.H. Nobby Clark was ready to play his part in fighting off the Nazi invasion of his homeland, the last Allied hope in Europe. Day after day, British Hurricanes and Spitfires bravely dueled with German Messerschmitt Bf-109s, but pilot officer Clark, prepared to serve king and country, was given a different kind of mission in a very different kind of aircraft. At 5.30 p.m. on September 26th, Clark was already airborne in his unwieldy Blackburn Rock, which had shown itself to be ineffective as a fighter, but made for a trusty search and rescue aircraft, when he received a report of British airmen being shot down off the coast of the Isle of Wight. With intrepid gunner Sergeant Hunt in tow, Clark bounded towards the search area, determined to arrive on time to rescue his countrymen from the chilly waters below. Arriving at the scene, the pair desperately scanned the ocean for survivors, their eyes straining against the rapidly encroaching darkness. Forty-five minutes passed with no luck. The only other sign of life was the faint outline of a friendly swordfish seaplane in the distance, probably engaged in a similar search and rescue mission. But as the two aircraft drew nearer, Clark noticed something was amiss. The size, the markings, it just didn't add up. Going in for a closer look, his suspicions were confirmed. They had stumbled upon a German Hinkle HE-59 seaplane, out to save its own downed comrades. Clark's awkward and slow-moving rock was all he had, and he was about to put it to the test in what would become one of World War II's most bizarre showdowns. Despite the controversy surrounding the Blackburn Rock's design, there were logical principles behind it. The Rock was an example of a turret fighter, an aircraft whose armament consisted of one or more machine guns mounted on a flexible turret, as opposed to having fixed weapons that could only fire frontwards. The advantages of this were twofold. Not only did it allow the fighter to defend itself against attacks from various angles, including the rear, but it also provided for an aiming technique known as no-allowance shooting. A fighter with front-firing guns would have to position itself in such a way that it could aim not at where the enemy aircraft was at that moment, but where it would be by the time the bullets reached it, known as deflection shooting. This would become even more complicated if the aircraft were pulling hard turns, as the angle would require the attacking fighter to pull its nose and shoot at a target that it couldn't even see. By contrast, through the use of a gun that could be angled upwards, a turret fighter could aim directly at a turning target, making it far easier to achieve a hit. During World War I, turret fighters had been used to great effect by the British, as models like the Bristol F-2 fighter and the Airco DH-4 proved invaluable for protecting reconnaissance planes from airborne attacks by the German enemy. However, the turret fighters of the early 1930s, such as the Hawker Demon, would start showing signs of trouble. As aircraft got faster, the force of the slipstream increased making it far more difficult to operate the guns. The addition of a protective shield went some way to improving the demon gunner's ability to hit the target, but when the turret was pointed to the side, the accuracy of the two fixed guns was severely affected. Nevertheless, the British Air Ministry remained committed to producing turret fighters. On December 31, 1935, the Air Ministry officially began the search for a carrier-based turret-armed fighter for the fleet air arm, the aviation component of the Royal Navy. Headed by G.E. Petty, the Yorkshire-based Blackburn Aircraft Design Team immediately got to work developing a turret fighter variation of their brand new Skua dive bomber, which would eventually become the Rock. Just like the Skua, the Rock would be a low-wing cantilever monoplane, boasting an all-metal construction and a two-seater configuration. It would come with a retractable tailwheel undercarriage, providing good ground handling and reduced drag during flight, as well as folding wings for ease of storage on aircraft carriers, where space was often limited. What's more, it would keep the Skua's wing-mounted dive brakes, which had been shown to improve maneuverability, accuracy, and safety. Both aircraft would use Bristol Perseus engines to drive their three-blade propellers and contained marine equipment in the rear fuselage, including a collapsible dinghy for emergency operations on water. However, Petty's team also tried to give the Rock some advantages over the Skua. They used a different main plane with a slight dihedral, eliminating the need for upturned wingtips, which tended to cause drag and reduce efficiency. They also added attachment points for a float undercarriage, giving it the ability to land and take off from water surfaces. The Rock's hydraulically powered Fraser Nash turret could rotate in any direction, and by using a control column, its four electrically fired 303-inch Browning machine guns would allow its gunner to blast rounds into enemy aircraft at angles as high as 85 degrees above the horizon. It also featured an integrated automatic interruption to avoid hitting its own propeller or tail unit. Rounding out its arsenal, the Rock's underwing racks were loaded with two 250-pound bombs and eight 30-pound bombs. Crucially, however, it didn't have any front-firing guns, 
meaning it would have to rely entirely on its turret in a dogfight situation. As Blackburn was busy working on the design for the Rock in the West Midlands, rival company Bolton Paul put together a proposal for their own turret fighter. Known as the P-85, it was designed as a naval version of the land-based P-82, soon to be christened the Defiant. Although this new Sea Defiant was expected to be capable of speeds over 300 miles per hour, the Air Ministry inexplicably rejected it in favor of the Rock, which could only manage a maximum of 223 miles per hour, placing an off-the-drawing-board order for 136 units on April 28, 1937. Adding insult to injury, Bolton Paul was then subcontracted for the production of the Rock, forcing them to delay the production of the Defiant. Pilot H.J. Wilson took the prototype rock out on its maiden flight on December 23, 1938. Though it showed good handling, there was much concern about its disappointing top speed. There were also serious problems with the planned conversion that would allow the rock to operate as a float plane. The first kit trialed caused severe instability, and while the second one managed to partially fix the issue by adding an enlarged ventral fin, it dropped the rock's maximum speed even further to 193 miles per hour. Navy officials began casting doubts on the rock's viability, with 5th Sea Lord Alexander Ramsey, Chief of Naval Air Services, suggesting that the project should be abandoned. While skeptical about the rock's abilities in combat situations, the Air Ministry was reluctant to cancel production. They wanted to avoid further disrupting Bolton Paul's production schedule. As the potential outbreak of war was becoming more and more likely, a fleet air arm couldn't afford to wait around for an alternative. As World War II got underway, the rock's shortcomings were quickly noted, especially as it typically flew side by side with the more adept Skua. When the 803rd Naval Air Squadron was assigned rocks for its mission to protect the Royal Naval Base at Scapa Flow in northern Scotland, the squadron leader complained that the rocks were constantly slowing them down and asked to trade them in for more Skuas instead. In the spring of 1940, the rocks' inadequacy was made further apparent in the Allies' failed Norwegian campaign, as time and time again, it was unable to provide effective resistance against the German invaders. But the rock was not ready to be written off just yet. On May 28th of that year, during the evacuations of Dunkirk, pilot midshipman A.G. Day, flying his rock alongside two skuas as part of the 806th Naval Air Squadron, suddenly came face to face with five Junkers JU-88s attacking a British convoy near Ostend in Belgium. As the skuas soared over the German aircraft to launch a scorching attack from above, Day dipped below them so his gunner could take full advantage of his turret-mounted Brownings and give the enemy an unwanted introduction to the famous no-allowance shooting. Launching an intense flurry of bullets skyward, the plucky rock sent one unfortunate Ju-88 plummeting toward the sea below in a cloud of smoke. Satisfied with his victory, Day was able to head back to the safety of the RAF base at Detling. The Blackburn Rock's victory at Dunkirk was not enough to convince naval authorities of its value as a fighter and while it participated in bombing attacks on Boulogne and Camp Grinez during June 1946, it soon found itself reassigned to air-sea rescue and target towing roles. Yet circumstances would soon conspire to give the Rock an unexpected shot at aerial combat heroism. As a member of the 2nd Anti-Aircraft Cooperation Unit, abbreviated to 2AACU, Pilot Officer D.H. Nobby Clark was assigned Blackburn Rock L-3805, which he duly customized by painting a red saint from the Leslie Charteris novels in a red-framed yellow diamond on either side of the rear fuselage of the aircraft. Clark was part of a search and rescue operation designed to save the lives of RAF pilots shot down in the Battle of Britain. The afternoon of September 26 was drawing to a close when a muffled voice came over the radio to inform Clark about downed pilots in need of assistance, approximately 15 miles southwest of St. Catherine's Point, the southernmost tip of the Isle of Wight. Without a moment's delay, he and his gunner, Sergeant Hunt, set off to find them, but a search of three quarters of an hour proved fruitless. Becoming aware of what looked like a swordfish seaplane around three miles away, he assumed it was part of a fellow British search and rescue mission. However, as the two planes gradually got closer to one another, he soon realized his mistake, noticing that it was, in fact, a twin-engine float plane. Approaching the aircraft to get a closer look, he was soon able to identify it as a German Henkel HE-59. Doubts raced through his mind. The Henkel was probably also out to save survivors, he hesitated to engage it in a fight. His dilemma was soon answered for him when the Nazi float plane opened fire first. As Clark narrowly dodged bullets from the Hinkle's 799mm machine gun, Hunt returned fire, sending a tracer flying to the Hinkle's fuselage. The least likely dogfight of World War II was underway. The excitement of the unexpected skirmish resulted in Hunt's intercom lead being pulled out, but the two were able to re-establish communication in time to plan their next move. 
As the Hinko retreated towards France, barely skimming the tops of the waves, the Blackburn Rock went in hot pursuit. Once ridiculed for its sluggish pace, it now found itself outrunning the Hinkle, which could barely manage a top speed of 137 miles per hour as it desperately tried to escape. Closing in to 300 yards, Clark dropped a wing, the rock's propeller perilously close to the waves as Hunt fired off another broadside. The Hinkle retaliated from its three gun positions, bullets blazing dangerously close. Yet Clark's skillful piloting kept the rock dancing just above the water, evading the worst of the enemy's fire. For a tense 25 minutes, the pair of lumbering rescue aircraft found themselves locked in a deadly duel, exchanging savage bursts of gunfire as if they were heroic flying aces. Neither of the two escaped damage, yet neither was able to overpower its rival. Clark heard one of the Hinkle's gunners fall silent, but realizing they were rapidly approaching the French coastline, he prepared to turn away before having to face the threat of Nazi anti-aircraft weapons. Just as it seemed the battle was over, the rock was shaken by a direct hit on its engine, which began sputtering ominously. With quick thinking, Clark switched to the 17-gallon reserve fuel tank, coaxing the wounded aircraft skyward. Knowing it would only get so far, he began thinking about ditching, but just at that moment, the engine sprung back to life, and he was successfully able to nurse it back to Gosport Airfield. Before the rock could taxi in, its engine coughed its last breath, drained of fuel. Barely able to believe what had happened, Clark and Hunt now had a claim for a damaged Hinkle under their belts, yet it soon became apparent that things could have gone a lot differently. Upon inspection, the ground crew made the shocking discovery of two incendiary bullets floating in the main fuel tank, just underneath Clark's seat. Fortunately, they had entered low down in the fuel, which had extinguished them before they'd had a chance to do any damage. A few inches higher, and the tank would have exploded. Clark and Hunt didn't realize just how close they'd come to being blown to oblivion. It was a fitting ending for a surreal evening. While the Blackburn Rock's dogfight with the Hinkle had certainly provided a surprising story, it didn't go any way to persuading British Naval Air Services of its abilities. Its use was limited to far-off locations such as Bermuda before the last of its kind were finally withdrawn from service in June 1943. Despite being based on solid theory, in practice it simply wasn't up to the standards of the other fighters of its day. Yet, Pilot Officer Clark's peculiar combat encounter will forever be remembered as one of the strangest moments of World War II.